Well, hello there and welcome on into the Kiwi Football Fix where we shine a spotlight on all things New Zealand football. I haven't seen this guy for quite some time, but it is an absolute pleasure to welcome into the studio the Spoon, Jacob Spoonley, former All Whites keeper. How are you, mate? I'm good, I'm good. And um, I was referred to in the email by the producer, Christina, as the A-League dude. So I'm, I'm quite happy with that. I'm yeah, going to roll with that's that. That's right. Thank with, you, Christina. With, with Sky Sport, you are our A-League guy. <laughs> On the Kiwi Football <laughs> Fix, you are our everything man. But before we get started and before we welcome in Jason Pine, Mr Football, what have you been doing with yourself? I saw last month that you've actually signed up with PFA, Professional yep. Footballers Australia. That's right. What's your role with them all about? Um, well, it was largely similar to the role that I was doing for the NZPFA. And the Players Association uh, are very important. They protect and promote the rights of players. And that's something that we're going to get into later on in the show, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, but I was involved in the transitional process uh, with the A-League last year and the adjustments that needed to be made for COVID. So um, that kind of translated into the opening for an opportunity to move across to Australia and the mm. PFA. Um, not to Australia just yet, Goran. There's a, a small issue related to COVID that we need to deal with. Yeah, first. okay, border restrictions and all of that. Yeah. So when are you hoping to get across there? When do we lose you, rather? <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, we'll be back uh, as often as possible, but um, we're aiming for kind of February, March. That seems to be the natural window, trying to avoid quarantine and the, uh, the money expense that comes with that. I can understand that. So what are the challenging things that you're faced with at the moment? Um, well, look, we're still dealing with the latency issues related to the adjustments that were required for COVID. And um, we've got the small matter of getting the Phoenix across uh, and setting them up in Wollongong. So um, we've been collaborating with the club on that. It's been a really uh, great exercise. The club's engaged and, and really jumped into it with both feet and supporting the players as best that they can. But there's still a lot of challenges that need to be addressed. So um, on the phone with the likes of David Dunn and Sean Gill and the players quite a bit at the moment. Well, I wish you all the very best with oh, that, Jacob. You. And uh, look, you know, I think it needs to be pointed out that Jacob Spoonley, like myself, is a Liverpool supporter. And it is with great pride that I welcome in one of the nicest people in New Zealand media, Jason Pine, who is also a Liverpool supporter. Piney, come on in, mate. Great to have you with us on the Kiwi Football Fix. Yes, um, proud to be wearing the... Well, I'm not wearing the red today, but uh, but proud to be a Liverpool fan and joining uh, other like my people in uh, such uh, salute surroundings. Now, before people vomit into their mouths, uh, let's move quickly into the A-League season because it is fast approaching, guys. And the Phoenix are entrenched in Australia. What are we expecting from them, Piney? Uh, obviously, they've lost Stephen Taylor. There's no Gary Hooper up front. How satisfied are you with this, the squad that they've got at their disposal? Yeah, when you lose players like that and also, obviously, Libby Kikachi, who was such what they were all about last season, they are big holes to fill. But then you look at the players who are still there. And compared to last season, when Ufuk Tele had seven players from the previous squad to uh, work with and had to recruit a dozen and more he's seen there from last season yes he's lost some crucial players but I think he's recruited pretty well we know a lot about Toma Hamed just yet we know about his pedigree and, and he looks like a swap for Gary Hooper at the back uh, James McGarry comes in and for me again seems like a guy who could slot in that uh, left back spot made vacant by Libby Kikachi and really make a go of it Central defence is interesting. Uh, Jake knows a bit more about Teata Fai Hudson Weehongi than I do. We've also got Josh Laws, of course, who's come into the side, this young Australian. And guys back from last year, the likes of Ulysses Davila, David Ball, Cameron Devlin, Steph Rinovich. Guys who were a really big part of, of that third place finish last year. So, look, I feel optimistic. I think we can be cautiously optimistic about how they'll go. Yeah, I agree with Piney. And look, the important thing for me is that we haven't seen a change to the structure of the Phoenix. So there's been personnel change and that was always going to happen because of COVID. It's um, unfortunate we've lost the likes of Taylor, Hooper and Steinman. But I think by and large what we've seen is like for like um, substitution. So Hamid up front for Hooper, as Piney said. And all the feedback that I'm getting from my Australian colleagues is that Josh Laws is a really solid performer. Um, somebody that won't necessarily set the house on fire, but at the same time, um, someone that's going to provide you with those six, seven, eight out of ten performances each week. Last season, it was uh, one of the Phoenix's best. In, well, actually, it was the, their best finish in the league ever, wasn't it? But the arse kind of fell out, for want of a better term, <laughs> once they came back from COVID piney. What do you think Ufuk Tele has said to the roster about trying to maintain standards throughout the course of the competition? 
the first thing they've done is they've approached it completely differently, Goran, from the way they did last year. And look, they were we were all learning last year. We had no idea what what the right thing to do was as far as how to approach a uh, a season that was COVID. This season, what they've done is they've got to Wollongong and they've basically told all the guys to go out and find places to live. They're not going to live in a hotel. They've all got their own flats and own places to live. A few of them are actually flatting together, but that happens back in Wellington as well. So what they're trying to do is replicate as closely as possible what it would like if they were living in Wellington. They go to training, they do their training, they do their team session thing, but then they go home. They can do things. They can go out to the beach. They go to the shops. They do what young men do in their spare time. But they come together for training and for games. They've got a home stadium of women's stadium. So it's almost as though they've, 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 take, they've picked everything up from, from Wellington, dropped in Wollongong, and will hope that that rates as closely as possible. The success they had pre-COVID, because let's not forget, guys, they were flying. Mm-hmm. They'd won four in a row COVID hit. They were looking every inch aside that, that could challenge for the silverware. And as you so eloquently put it, Goran, the, the ass fell out of it after, after uh, COVID hit. So, <laughs> I shouldn't have said it. Back, I'm so sorry. The back end. <laughs> let's hope the back end stays firmly in time. And I get the feeling it might. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what we can attribute a lot of the loss of momentum, Goran, down to last there season after the restart is that like Piney said, better put. The, <laughs> the players simply didn't have normality. They were in a hotel room. They didn't have any chance to escape football. So mm. um, when you've lost a game like they did against Sydney, for example, a big game that they were obviously targeting um, to get points from, um, you're stuck with that game and you have to live with it until you play the next game. And that might sound something that's very simple and obvious, but it was as if they, were, that they couldn't move on. They didn't have any normalcy. Um, so that's going to be really important um, for this season coming up. How, it- much, how, how important is it, is it on uh, Ulysses de Villa's shoulders to, to follow up what he did last season in his second season in the A-League. Because quite often we see these guys, they burst onto the scene, they score a pile of goals, and then they can't back it up year after year. You know, is he a Roy Krishna in disguise? <laughs> well, uh, Roy's done pretty well for himself. So um, he'd be a player that I kind of hoped they might look at bringing back. But talking about Davila, it's going to be difficult for him in season two. You're right. Everybody knows what he can do in the A-League. Uh, he was targeted um, by oppositions during the return. So he mm. didn't uh, have the same impact. That then means you have to call upon the likes of Renault Piscopo and a player, although he's come home to his home club, he won't play a home game for a wee while, Clayton Lewis. I'm expecting big things from Clayton Lewis. Not to say that this team uh, won't produce um, as a collective, but I think Clayton, this scheme suits him. We're already getting reports that he has really embraced life under Ufuk Tale, and I, uh, I think he's a player that you need to put in a situation in that professional environment to really get the best out of him. Clearly the Wellington Phoenix are going to do well in this season. Who are they going to be vying for the title with Piney? <laughs> yeah, good question. It's so hard to tell pre, uh, pre-season, but I guess you look at the usual suspects in Sydney FC, don't look as though they've been weakened really at all. They, they look as though they're a team that's going to be there or thereabout. Um, you know, you, you look around and Perth Glory look very, very good again on paper. Uh, they've had the Asian League, of course, so they've had a chance to play some games together and, and uh, you know, get some, some combinations going. See, Diego Castro was back, which is a massive boost for them because he, he's just been one of the best players in A-League history for me, even though he's in his advancing years now. You combine him with Romaroli and Andy Keogh, and that is quite the strike force that Perth Glory have. So Perth Glory, I think Sydney FC, and Melbourne City a season, but they're starting a bit about them as well. Of the others, somebody always somebody always has a season to forget, and like Melbourne victory last season has this has a season to remember. We think Newcastle a couple of years ago making it all the way to the grand final. Lots to get excited about uh, ahead of the A League season. Something that's not really exciting me at all is um, racism in football rearing its ugly head yet again across the globe. We see it in Millwall versus Derby. And then just yesterday, PSG versus Istanbul. Jacob, I, I know you're, you've got some very strong thoughts on this. First of all, you, your thoughts on what's happened. And second of all, how do we fix this? This is a very serious topic. And it's one that's been around for a while now. So um, you have to forgive me here if, if I jump on a couple of points. But fundamentally, what we're talking about here is the human right not to be discriminated discriminated against, in particular in the workplace. 
So anyone else that shows up to work, you can uh, rest assured that uh, you should not be discriminated against. And if you are, there are real repercussions for that. The person will be held accountable. We have not seen that play out in football. And it's been a big bugbear for a lot of people in my industry, in particular Brendan Schwab, who's the uh, head of the World Players Union. And he's been someone that's been advocating for this for a long time. Um, so the players have a right uh, to a freedom of expression in relation to supporting Black Lives Matter. Um, and for someone to walk along, uh, be selected as part of a group that can attend a game, to then show up and boo, I, I just don't know what you can do to help these sorts of people. Obviously there's education that we can undertake, but that is fundamentally something that um, I just simply disagree with, and I know a lot of the playing group just can't understand why you would choose to do that. Mm. Um, the next point is, how do we solve it? And this is a real issue. What I would say as an initial comment is that the organizations themselves have had a long time to deal with this. So for people that are saying, well, you can deal with it after the game. Um, why should the players walk off the field as they did in the PSG game? And the simple answer is there's a void at the moment and it's down to players to act. So player activism, I think, is a real driver for this. It's going to meet the issue head on. Mm. And um, I can only um, commend uh, the players for acting in the way they did. In particular, that both teams decided that it simply wasn't good enough and that they should have e they should exit the field. Heine, you've been around the world as a f legendary football commentator as you are. I'm, I'm keen to hear your take on all of this. Oh, I don't think we've got enough time even to start examining the is uh, The worrying thing about the um, latest event in the PSG Basakshi here game was that the incident came from an official in the game. Uh, Jake's right, there are, you know, there are people who come along to football games who have views which are irregular to what we are all about. And I just don't know what you do uh, from self and amongst fan groups. I'm not quite sure what you do about that. But when officials are either racist or at least ignorant of the fact that what we're doing has a racist element to it, then I think that shows us We've still got a very, very long way to go. I agree with the players from walking off. Something has to be done. They had to do something to draw it to this. And, you know, I think the more that that is brought attention, the better. But I just fear we still have a very, very long way to go here. Uh, do you think we're doing enough in New Zealand to address a matter like this? It's interesting. I think New Zealanders often will look at um, the behaviour that players are subject to in Europe. Um, including that PSG game, and think that's not something that goes on here. And I think it's not overt, but um, racism definitely uh, has a role within New Zealand, and it's something that my dad could probably speak a lot more eloquently on than I can. Um, uh, so um, it's not as present, um, but it is, uh, sorry, it's not, not as obvious, but it is present is a better way to say it. Um, and I've heard stories anecdotally about players being the subject of racist comments on the field. And it's something that you have to take responsibility, I think, as a player or as a coach. And if you if you see it, you've got to stamp it out mm. really simply. So that's the best defense that I can see is um, an organized community that simply says this is not good enough. Mm. I was uh, I was looking through the New Zealand Herald sports section the other day and I saw that there's like an all time all whites first 11. Uh, that's been selected by a, a number of individuals. Did, are you across this? No, I'm not. It was, I mean, was my name bandied about at all? I mean, my, my two caps for the All Whites, I imagine, were a substantial contribution. Mm. Was it something that the public voted on? Uh, no, I think they got together like a, a crack team of experts <laughs> and uh, former internationals and commentators, and, and somehow Martin Devlin found his way into the mix. Um, do you know anything about this, Jason Pine? Piney. Oh dear. Well, how bloody convenient, because um, he was one of the guys who put the squad together. I'll, I'll tell you who was in it, who, who made the cut. So up front, it was Chris Wood and Winton Roofer. Across the middle, Michael McGarry, Grant Turner, Steve Sumner was the skipper, Ryan Thomas out on the right, Simon Elliott sat in front of a back three with Ivan Visalich, Ryan Nelson, Winston Reid, and Mark Paston in goal. Jacob, we don't have the thoughts of Jason Pine, whose internet connection has just very conveniently shattered itself. <laughs> what do you make of this 11? Uh, it's an interesting one. I think you can agree with lots of aspects of it. Um, there obviously would have been a couple of tough decisions. Woodsy and Winton Roof are up top. Really hard to argue with. Giving the armband to Steve Sumner. Again, something that I think you get almost consensus on. The one issue, the first issue I have is 
what is it, a 3 1 4 2? Yeah. You've not got much at the back there. You're putting <laughs> no. a lot of responsibility on Ivan and Nelly and Winnie. Um, They're so good. They, they, they are, are good. good. They are good. Um, so a little bit unbalanced there. Um, I, I think there's probably going to be some questions about um, Steve Wooden's name was bandied around. Uh, Pasty was fantastic at the 2010 World Cup. Um, uh, Van Haddam in the 82 World Cup. Richard Wilson who got us there. So maybe Michael Udding as well, someone who's contributed mm. to the All Whites before Pasty. So there, there's, there's some question marks there. Um, I'm hoping the Herald's going to get some chat about this because usually football fans are quite <laughs> parochial in this regard. Uh, I like that there's Ryan Nelson in there. I think we've got some players in the current crop that will be in that 11 eventually. They're like Sarpreet Singh. Sarpreet Singh is a great one. And for me, one that's flying under the radar at the moment, who has been very, very solid at a peripheral European league, is Joe Bell. He is playing some great football. He's a defensive midfielder or a defensive-oriented midfielder, um, but he's showing up with goals and assists, which is mm. something that you can't, you can't really buy as a player if you want to add that to your armory. So I think... He might be somebody that makes his way onto the list with Sarpreet and Libby Gacace. Jacob made mention of the fact that Melbourne victory in the A-League are going to get up to something in the upcoming season. But what about the women's equivalent? How are they shaping up for the W League, Jacob? Mate, I'm loving it. So Melbourne Victory has gone out and got themselves a, a Kiwi contingent in both the men's and women's game. And to see Claudia Bunge and Annelie Longo uh, as part of um, what will be the W League squad for the upcoming season, I think it's fantastic. Particularly as unfortunately we don't have a Phoenix side in the W League this year. That is a terrible shame. We'll talk about that with our next guest. Her name is Annalie Longo. Come on in from Australia. Annalie, great to have you with us on the Kiwi Football Fix. Hi, guys. How are you? I can't yeah, say I'm in Australia good. yet. I'm still in uh, New Zealand, but um, nice to see you both. Oh, when do you go over? Uh, depending on the results this weekend, could be uh, next week or the week after. Right, OK. And so what do you know about what to expect when you get to Australia? Yeah, I'm going to take some notes, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> what do I know? Um, it's obviously uh, in the middle of summer, so it's going to be a hot contingent for the uh, the W League this year. Um, but obviously had the experience over in Melbourne last year, so really looking forward to it. There's a new group of players, um, and there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement um, around the around the league, and um, obviously grateful to be playing. So yeah, excited to head back over and. Um, Excited to be to join the team and um, start uh, another W League campaign. We just had Jason Pine on talking about what the Wellington Phoenix are going to be getting up to in Australia, and they're trying to approach it as normal as possible. I don't think they've got a, a bubble, for example. So, do you know if the Melbourne Victory women's team has a bubble? How will you actually be integrated into society, if at all? <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of uncertainty. That's um, a, a huge thing with this whole entire year. You know, you, you never know, and it's pretty hard to plan things. But uh, as far as I know, um, I'm heading over. I don't have to quarantine, which is nice coming from New Zealand. Um, and I'll, I'll join the team, and we'll go straight into training. And we actually start our first game on the 27th of December, so pretty quickly. Um, so we're unsure how that looks, if we're travelling yet, or, or if there's a bubble or a hub or anything. But at the moment, we're status quo. Um, we're playing away. Uh, Western Sydney Wanderers first game so we're traveling away and hopefully that goes ahead and we have a, a smooth season. Last season was your first season back in the W League for a number of years I think you were with Sydney back in 2012-2013 if my memory serves me right how has the quality of the league changed in that time? Yeah definitely it's grown it's grown massively and the professionalism around the league um, traveling the day before games, all those things, um, CBA agreements, player payments, all those things are growing to, to create a better experience for players. This year's a little bit different in terms of not so many internationals, I think, will be coming into the league as, as the year we've had, but um, it's really growing. You know, there's a lot of world class players, marquee players coming into the league. So, um, yeah, it's only getting bigger and bigger, and, and, and hopefully one day you might be able to see a New Zealand team um, in the league as well. Oh, touch wood, Annalie. Um, hopefully that comes about sooner rather than later. Uh, now, you've obviously been recruiting as well. We've got another Kiwi in the Melbourne Victory side, one that we touched on uh, previously. Claudia Bunge, what can we expect for her, from her and her contributions for Melbourne Victory this season? Yeah, she's a, a fantastic player and she's shown that through the New Zealand leagues back here. She stepped into the ferns at a very young age and I think she did exceptional. She did really well. So I'm excited for her future. Um, she's an exciting player. She's obviously um, a centre back, so she's solid. Um, she's athletic. She's quick. So um, yeah, I hope hope she can learn and 
um, and um, and it's just a step in her career and hopefully she continues to be a fern and, and goes on to, to bigger things. You mentioned it earlier, uh, no Wellington Phoenix side in the W League, even though they tried and they tried and they tried. A as a New Zealander, how disappointed were you that they weren't included? Yeah, it's obviously disappointing, but on the uh, flip side of that, um, I think we've got now a real opportunity to get ready and get set and do it properly. So, um, although it didn't go over the line this year, I think the conversations have started and I think we can plan and hopefully next year you'll see um, yeah, a W League Wellington Phoenix side in there um, and be well prepared and yeah, hopefully get a lot of Kiwi girls um, coming home and to play in that team. And do you have a particular goal in mind that you'd be preparing for if you were to be playing for the uh, Wellington Phoenix uh, next season? Yeah, no, definitely not. Um, yeah, no, no me, big tournament coming? At this, this stage <laughs> is, a, is, a, is the victory and, um, and doing as best as I can for that team and, and the club. So um, that's my focus at the moment and um, yeah, we'll see how next year goes. But if that wasn't your focus, then yeah, what I, would you I might be have focused her up there. I might have stitched yeah. Annalie up there a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> a particular World Cup, Annalie. Would it, I rate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would it be like preparing for a World Cup and playing for a, a New Zealand-based W League side? That's that, that sounds like the dream to me. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I guess uh, the, the thought of having a World Cup in your home country is pretty amazing. So um, to, to get that across the line and possibly have a professional team here in New Zealand, it's the next step forward for us. So, um, yeah, it would be nice to, to get some hype and, and um, visibility around the women's game and the Phoenix will help do that um, potentially. So, yeah, it's an exciting opportunity and, and hopefully, fingers crossed, it gets across the line. Because you've experienced a World Cup on home soil before. Back in 2008, you were part of the 17s, scored a goal. It's uh, still quite memorable. It must mean, you know, for you to get back and do it, uh, that, that would be everything to you, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's almost full circle. It was, yeah, a long time, time ago, back in 2008, but it's still one of my fondest memories and um, there's nothing like having Kiwis and the fans and your friends and family there. Um, watching the games and yeah that was an under 17 World Cup and, and you know how much bigger a, a women's World Cup is you know you've got millions and millions of people around the world watching it um, and so yeah a little bit of a full circle for me um, so yeah it's an exciting prospect. And just focusing now a little bit closer to home um, unfortunately you, you've been injured um, but the Canterbury Pride um, we're almost all of the way, how far are we, are we through for the National League at the moment? Another so week and then it's another finals. Week. So we're almost there. Um, are we going to see another Canterbury Pride side go deep into the competition? Absolutely. I think this weekend's game is, is huge. It's, it's come to be a, a semi-final match, um, the way the league's worked. So um, all we need is a draw, um, ideally a win, and that will see us through into a final for another year. Um, but the girls have been absolutely fantastic, and the legacy we've created here in Canterbury is, you know, really... Um, really proud to be a part of it um, and grow the game down here in the South Island. So there's a, a huge amount of work um, and good people that have you know built into the program. Uh, Gareth Turn Turnbull, Alana Gunn, Mike Devon, all those people, you know, huge, um, I guess, catalyst for how well the Pride have done. Um, and the players, again, have, have done an exceptional job. So hopefully we can, we can do it again. Where can you take advantage of Northern Lights? Where are they weak? No, Where good. are they soft? They're good across the board, mate. No, no, no. Let Annalie answer. No, no, no. They, you've already given the Cantabrian <laughs> something to tee off on. Are you supporting us or them? I'm from the North Shore, mate. There's, there's no question about it. I'm Switzerland. Here. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> Just the red and black, mate. Um, the Northern Lights, yeah, they're quality wide. I think they've shown that they beat Auckland this year um, quite comfortably. Um, I think they've got individually some, you know, outstanding players that have played um, for the Ferns, have played an age group level. So um, I think if they turn up, they're a real threat. So if we can nullify that early um, and kind of not give them a sniff, I think we've got a real chance to um, to, to win it and see us in the final again. Annalie, thanks so much for joining us on the Kiwi Football Fix. All the best in the ISPS Honda Premiership. Hope you make it through to that final. And also all the best with Melbourne Victory in the W League. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Well, and with that, Annalie's given us the game to watch in the ISPS Honda Women's Premiership. Jacob, what about the men? What's the, the fixture to, to keep your eyes across this one? Well, there's a couple of good fixtures coming off the weekend. So we've got Auckland uh, travelling down to Canterbury, I think, and that's going to be a great tussle. 
Aucklanders versus Canterburyans. Uh, but the game for me is going to be Team Wellington against Eastern Suburbs. Uh, last year, this game threw up a couple of um, crackers, and uh, I think we can expect that this season as well. Team Wellington uh, have done it late on occasion against opposition thus far, and Eastern Suburbs have pulled out some really dominant performances. So um, I'm looking forward to getting stuck into this one. Cool. Jacob, great to see you. Are you going to come back? Oh, absolutely. If I'm invited, absolutely. I'll make sure you are. You just I'll have to sure kick Piney are. out of the seat, apparently. That, that could be concerning. I don't think Piney's coming back after the uh, internet freezing episode. So, <laughs> you're all right. Thanks so much for your time, Spoon. Great to see you. Thank you. And you can always catch more on the Kiwi Football Fix. Same time, same place next week. Until then, we'll catch you later.